Good evening, everyone, and welcome to episode 23 of Scottonomics. The first thing I'd like to do is introduce my co-host, Karen Van Sweden. Hello, Karen. How are you doing? I'm good, William. How are you? I'm very well, although I've just realised it's episode 24 of Scottonomics. We're do- now we're doing weekly. I think we're struggling to keep up, aren't we? Uh, welcome to everyone who's joining us on uh, YouTube, Facebook and Twitter. And um, We really value your support and it's really nice to see you. Please do drop any comments in, um, either about what you've thought about what's been happening in the news or in economics this week. And also if you've got any particular thoughts on what we're covering tonight, which is MMT, Modern Monetary Theory. So Karen, what have you been up to this week? Well, I just wanted to comment. There was some interesting commentary on Radio Scotland from Oliver Bullock, I think it's pronounced, or Bullo. Um, and he's the author of Moneyland, um, which really illustrates the, um, the issue that people with lots of money really are not tied to countries in the same way that people who without lots of money are. And, um, you know, he, he's particularly important voice just now because, of course, People in the UK are becoming more and more aware of um, the kleptocracy that is, that is Westminster and the amount of Russian money that's been coming into the UK and the golden visas um, and all of that kind of thing. So I think that's getting a lot more exposure. If you're politically orientated, you might have known about this already. But if you're not so much, then I think it's going to be a big and frightening learning curve for a lot of people. Um, so yeah, that was that was really interesting. He was on Radio Scotland twice, so that was that was really good to hear that. Okay, I don't I don't know him. Who, what's his background? Do you know? I don't know what his background is, but he is a journalist or a writer, um, and yeah. So the book is called Moneyland, and I decided to get the audio book, so I started listening to it yesterday um, because it's one that's been on my list for a while, and and it's particularly. Uh, relevant just now and the other thing that happened today as well is that um, apparently Alex Salmond is back in the SNP according to the Prime Minister because um, he seemed to say that in the House of Commons today that he was part of the SNP which of course is not the case anymore he's the head of the ALBA party. I don't think that's likely to happen. (laughs) Um, You never know it's a strange world but I doubt that will happen. Um, Well tonight we're, we're talking about modern monetary theory and as you and I and we actually say to Warren I think that we're surprised we've got to episode 24 without having a session on MMT but what we're actually going to do is we've got this as an introduction and then next week we've got a really wonderful kind of personal story about a journey to MMT from an engineer who's become an economist um, and that's a that's a fascinating journey and then I think we'll probably get into MMT a little bit more but we want to be as broad as we can with everything that we're covering MMT is crucially important and this is why we're really keen to bring you this show tonight and I hope you enjoy it. Kieran, do you want to do us a little introduction? Yeah, so tonight we have Warren Mosler and he is an American economist, um, an entrepreneur, um, a financial professional and the father of modern monetary theory. He's also a co-founder of the Centre for Full Employment and Price Stability at the University of Missouri, Kansas City and he's also an author of Soft Currency Economics and the seven deadly innocent frauds of economic policy. So enjoy, hopefully, our interview with Warren. I think this is a brilliant introduction to MMT and and we're on our 20th show and we actually haven't really directly spoken about MMT and I think this is a brilliant introduction and and who better to have than the new than, than Warren to, to talk about it. So hi, hi Warren Mosler, and welcome, very much welcome to Scottonomics. It's great to get you onto the program. So right. I'd like to start off by asking uh, you: Can you tell our audience a wee bit about your background? Okay, so I uh, studied at the University of Connecticut. I grew up, born in Connecticut, grew up in Connecticut, and uh, didn't leave until 1976. So I have a uh, degree, undergraduate degree in economics, 1971. I went to work in 1973 at the uh, Savings Bank of Manchester, and that got me started in banking and finance. Uh, in 19, along the way, I worked at the Bankers Trust, which was a probably the, maybe one of the number one primary dealers 
uh, in the world at the time. And that was on 16 Wall Street. And I was on the, at the trading desk. I was, uh, they made me a uh, vice president, assistant vice president in charge of sales and trading of Ginny Mae Securities, which were the first derivatives uh, back then. And so, um, and, I had, and I had had almost no experience at all. But it was a time where they were just hiring people they thought could, they just took a chance. And uh, so I was there from 1976 to 1978. And that's where I got most of my information about the monetary system, monetary operations, uh, how things work. And I got, they didn't teach them to me. I just got them by observing what was happening and asking people who were trading the different securities, how they worked and why this went one way and how it was accounted for and that type of thing. And, and I, I pretty quickly developed a picture in my own mind about how the system worked. And that was, let's say, the early days of the understandings that are now come to be known as modern monetary theory. As you say, the awareness of how currencies function operationally inspired this book and hopefully will soon save the world from itself. And yeah. the other thing that you say after that as well that I th think is important, you know, to, under to understand you philosophically as well is in the midst of great abundance, our leaders promote privation. Yeah. We are told that national health care is unaffordable while hospital beds are empty. We are told that we cannot afford to hire more teachers while many teachers are unemployed. And we are told that we cannot afford to give away school lunches while surplus food goes to waste. Do you want to yeah. say something about those, those things that you, wh why you felt so driven to, um, it, you know, get more people to understand how the system works? Yeah. Well, look, I have enough to eat myself and I can afford my power bills, but a lot of people can't. And, and, and you know, the reason is because the leadership, I thought the leadership doesn't understand monetary operations. And I take the position that if they did understand them, they'd recognize that this austerity, which they think is necessary to preserve the currency and to preserve the functioning of the economy is based on false premise. And once you understand how it works, you don't have to do that at all uh, to achieve those goals that they thought they were, you know, using, that they thought they were achieving. And so that was, my whole motivation was to put policy options on the table that were not on the table, uh, thinking that that was the only chance those things were ever going to happen to get through. And that was, you know, 20, how many years ago was that? 1993, almost 30 years, right? 28 mm -hmm. years ago. Mm -hmm. So it's taken a while, but arguably it did save the world because uh, it wasn't too many years ago where President Obama said, and you can see the video clips, we are asked, when does the U.S. run out of money? He says, we're out of money now and we're borrowing from China. Mm -hmm. He actually took a trip to China, who he believed were our bankers, to make sure they would fund his deficits. Okay, And then you had Paul Ryan complaining about the stimulus program, talking about how the U.S. is going to be the next Greece and we're going to be at the IMF on our knees because the markets are going to cut off our funding. And, you know, Paul Krugman and the rest talking about how deficits were going to drive up interest rates and uh, create uh, all kinds of Armageddon. And, and now, if you look two or three years ago with COVID, we had $5 trillion or something like that of deficit spending. And none of that was in the debate. The only argument that we were getting even subsequent is whether or not this is going to cause inflation, which is exactly the goal of, the, you know, soft currency economics. That's what I started off trying to achieve, to have the debate shift from things that aren't applicable to the things that are applicable. And yes, yeah. you can overspend and cause inflation. Now, I'll make the argument that we haven't done that, but still, at least that's the argument. Now, some of these old, old arguments are sort of creeping in around the edges. You know, the, uh, Democrats, Biden said he was going to pay for everything in this last infrastructure bill. But he didn't say if he doesn't, the U.S. is going to default or go broke or we're going to be at the IMF begging for money. The implication was that there'd be inflation, which would cause the Fed to raise rates. Now, the inflation itself doesn't raise rates. It's, it causes the Fed to raise rates, which is what's in soft currency economics. It rates go up and down uh, because the Fed decide, votes at its meetings. It's not nothing in the economy, and it has a reaction function. Certain things cause it to 
go one way or the other. Now, I'd like to change that reaction function as well right now and with the, because I think they've got the rate thing backwards. That raising rates actually makes inflation worse. So why are they talking about raising rates now? And now they have absolutely no econometric evidence or support for the idea that raising rates fights inflation. At least 20 years ago, they used to come out with these you know, weak, very weak papers, but they were still research papers showing that if you raise rates, it would bring inflation down. And they would say, if you raise rates 1%, inflation would come down by a 10th with a two to four year lag, things like that. So it's pretty much meaningless because that was across two fiscal cycles and a commodity cycle and the whole thing. But at least they had something, right? As bad as it was. When was the last time you saw a research report from any central banks correlating interest rates with inflation and the idea that higher rates bring down inflation? You don't have it. And in fact, the evidence from the last 10 years shows the opposite. Uh, as they brought rates down, inflation came down as they measured and stayed down. And it wasn't until we got this COVID supply shock that some prices got pushed up, which they know very well is on the supply side. They can quote every, you know, their researchers are very good. You can't, I don't, you know, they're, they're the best. They're very good. And uh, they point to that. None of them point to, you know, it was because of excess demand. And yet they're talking about raising rates in March and without any any support from there. So that unsettling. OK, I'd, I'd like to see that change before they do it. Make some kind of a statement. Look, we need to do things about inflation, but our research shows that raising rates is not going to work. In fact, it's going to make it worse, which it does. OK, and so just get out there and be honest and, and say it. And it's not just that, it's the Bank of England. The Bank of England used to come out with studies and then uh, about how interest rates would cause things. And they haven't done that either because it, it doesn't. And the last thing they had, which wasn't officially Bank of England, but it was Richard Warner, is our, our Werner, as you said, talking about how it works in reverse. So Do you think that um, central banks are talking about interest rates and inflation again because they've been they haven't had any power to do anything meaningful for 10 years and yeah. you think if they now say well inflation's inflation's rising we can do something about it do you think there is a whole kind of i, I hate to kind of use the word of ego here but do you think yeah. this is a position for them to say hey we are still important we can do something and maybe they believe it or not but I think maybe that maybe the reason is that they want to be seen to be doing something because they've kind of lost their, their, their power over the last decade or so. Yeah. Well, the, the political appointees may be doing that, you know, but the operations people and senior guys at monetary affairs and in research at the Fed are not saying that. OK, they're, they're, they're intellectually honest people. They don't do that kind of thing. They're not politically motivated. I've met a lot of them and they're really high quality people. And they're just telling these guys one thing, and then they hear what they, the political appointees who are not, that's not who they are, of course. And, uh, and they're just rolling their eyes going like, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. And that's what's happening right now. Same with the European Central Bank. I know people who've been visiting them and talked to them, and they, they know that raising rates makes it worse. And they know that negative rates like they have now are a contractionary tax. It's a wealth tax. You know, whether you approve of it or not, it's not a stimulus. And they're... It's like, look, we've told these guys, and they, that's what they do, and we're not here to go public and criticize them. But in private, they'll all tell you that, you know, but they, they, the they're, not the type, they're not saying what you're saying. The political mm -hmm. appointees, maybe, yes, but not, mm -hmm. the, not the professionals inside the, these institutions. But the, the Bank of England did raise the interest rate, didn't it, just in December? It did put it up, I think it put it up to 0 0.25, and, yeah. and they're doing that in the belief that it's going gonna, it's gonna to bring down inflation, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't even, you know, I don't follow, I didn't follow it. But mm -hmm. if they did, I'm sure this, you know, the senior researchers are just rolling their eyes and going, look, we told them this is, <laughs> doesn't do it. You know, that that would certainly, first of all, nobody can make the case that it's been excess private sector credit growth that's causing a problem here. Mm -hmm. And the whole idea of raising rates is to bring down private sector credit growth. So it, which it doesn't do anyway, because, you know, the income effect more than offsets that. This, the tiny amount, a quarter of a point is not going to be noticeable anyway, but even you're going to get an income effect just as tiny and that offsets it. So you're not even going to get this minuscule effect that they think they're going to get. Yeah. It's clear that a lot of the political class, and you can't expect them to be fair to them as well, to be very yeah. knowledgeable about economics. It's not also why they're elected, you know, because often yeah. they're elected 
because of the type of person they are and other aspects of their background as well. So that's completely fair. Um, but, you know, it is it is actually quite incumbent once they get into office to understand this. And uh, happily, we saw John Yarmouth of Kentucky uh, speaking yeah. quite openly about his um, understanding now. and. Yeah. You know, I know there are certainly politicians um, that we know as well who understand this too. And again, yeah. another quote from the book as well, which I think really encapsulates what you're trying to get across about what's really important in the economy are the real resources. So you say, when people and physical capital are employed productively, government spending that shifts those resources to alternative use forces a trade-off. For example, if thousands of young men and women were conscripted into the armed forces, the country would receive the benefit of a stronger military force. However, if the new soldiers had been home builders, the may nation may suffer a shortage of new homes. This trade-off may reduce the general welfare of the nation if Americans place greater value on new homes than additional military protection. If, however, the new military manpower comes not from home builders, but from individuals who are unemployed, then there is no trade off. Now, I think that's a very clear example of getting politicians and the general public to understand the quite big difference between a business and a country. And for a country, you know, resources are what matter. The currency is just a tool. Yeah, so for the country, what they're trying to do is. Uh provide public infrastructure for public purpose is what I call it, which is the military, the legal system, and uh, the public health and public education. And those are political decisions. And the more real resources, the more people you want in the public sector, the fewer you're going to have in the private sector. So you have to make a decision. You've got a real trade-off there on doing that. And then the monetary system is the tool to accomplish that. So I had a very interesting discussion with somebody from the Pentagon in like 1999. And uh, he said, uh, you know, we really need to expand the military. So I said, you should have done that seven or eight years ago when unemployment was high. You know, because today unemployment is 3%. You're going to be taking resources, people who are already working, you, you know, out of the private sector that are productive. You're going to be taking steel capacity that's being used. You know, we had high capacity utilization. So if you'd done it seven years ago, when we had high unemployment and excess capacity, it wouldn't have been any cost to the uh, private sector at that point. He says, well, but, but we couldn't do that because back then we we're running a deficit. Today we have a surplus. <laughs> so, I, I, you know, I, I think that tells you everything that's wrong with how public policy is formed. OK, they're using the, the monetary system, which gives them zero information about how to allocate resources between private and public for 100% of their information. <laughs> Uh, yeah, whether it, whether or not they can do it. And in the UK, we've had a regime in for a long time that views immigrants very poorly. It's not the case in Scotland. Scotland is underpopulated. We need more people mm -hmm. in Scotland. Um, all the infrastructure, the government infrastructure is in London. So it has attracted a lot of businesses, NGOs, everything to London, which is it's a massively unbalanced uh, the UK is massively unbalanced in that sense. So there is a perception that there is too many immigrants around these very congested areas, I would, I would argue as well. A lot of politicians are trying to run everything right down to the, to the, the nub and not really ensure that we have more capacity for uh, bad events that might, might happen, the pandemic being an example. Yeah, and, and if you look at President Biden, what he's threatening Russia with is you know, we're going to cut off your international banking ties. <laughs> it's like, it's almost like something out of Monty Python, right? What's the next thing he's going to do? Threaten to call the, the you know, the guy's sister a bad name or something? <laughs> you know, so yeah, good, yeah. good point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and again, it's that, that realization that a country, it's not a business. It's, you know, you're not, you, you know, you're not, um, the currency is is the tool for a country. It's not the same right, as right, right. currency users when you're a yeah. currency creator. And, and of course, the big thing is that help got across this is a sequence. You know, all the mainstream models have the government has to tax first in order to get money to spend. And if they want to spend more than that, they have to borrow to get money to spend. And that's the basis of G minus T and all those equations in their model. 
when in fact, you know, everybody in central banks know you can't, the way they say it, you can't do a reserve drain, get money, have them pay the government without first doing a prior reserve ad. You have to spend first so the funds are there to, uh, to, to pay the government. So um, whether you're paying taxes or buying securities. Well, look, everybody knows the f- football stadium doesn't collect the tickets first and then sell them. Okay, it's pretty obvious. And so if you look at the currency as the government's tickets, you know, it has to spend the tickets, get them out there first before it can collect them. And so once you understand that, it's, you know, because the source, government is the source of all the funds that can be used to pay taxes. That's how the institutional uh, structure is set up. You know, and so that was a big thing. That That's what um, one of the contributions MMT made to mainstream that's overturned mainstream economics. And so they're like little things like that. It, it's it, where it's not the same as a business or a household or anything like that. Only in that, you know, the funds to pay taxes come from the government. And that was the first thing we pointed out. And that's where the whole solvency issue goes away. If the government has to spend first before we can pay our taxes, what do you, you talk about running out of money? It doesn't make any sense. You know, it's not an applicable concept to the, to, to what's going on. It's just completely out of left field. And so that has turned around and that sequence is now better understood. And that's fully supported by everybody in the central bank. And somebody did in your UK did a very good study on central bank operations, pointing that out, you know, not too long ago. Well, what's really interesting is here you back yeah. up what some of the other American economists who we've luckily had uh, lucky enough yeah. to have on the show. It, it's almost like it's a done deal now in the States. People understand MMT. Yeah. They understand the currency issue. They understand the non-relationship to inflation, or that's where there's a little bit of a discussion. But if you were to land um, on a foreign on a foreign planet rather than a foreign country or the United Kingdom, the discussion is not happening. We're still very much in a, in the world that we that, that that we've been in for the last forty years, and even yeah. the opposition in the United Kingdom um, and even the Scottish government, which is you know a little bit more left leaning, are still very much along the same lines of balanced budgets and yeah. taxing and taxpayers' money. Is there any lessons that we can learn from you about how to change the narrative in Scotland and in the United Kingdom in more, more, in more general terms? You know, well, interesting enough, it's happened in the United States. It took a while, but it's happened from the bottom up. Okay, I, I was just talking to a guy yesterday who uh, worked as a software manager and then just got a job on a ship on a boat you know an old wooden sailing ship trying to you know nothing to do with finance or anything else he said you know i read your book now i've gotten really excited about this and i'm talking to everybody about it and it's like you know how improbable is that that people would get excited and talk about you know monetary operations at the fed and the treasury but they do and and so what what it's showing you know it used to be just me and my partners at my firm and then it was you know, 1996, three years later, I introduced it on the internet to the academics. And then it was just Randy and Bill and Pavlina and a couple others. And Pavlina wrote the definitive paper, by the way, on inflation back then, you know, monopoly pricing and everything. And, and ask me about that in a minute. So, but, but it was just eight of us or 10 of us. Then it was 15 or 20 and it was growing. It was growing geometrically, which is a very slow process. You know, one, then two, then four, then eight, then 16, then 32. Five years later, you're only at 32. But now we've hit 25 years, and now we're in the millions. And nobody ever goes backwards. Nobody ever understands. Once they understand the government can't run out of money, they don't say, oh, you know what? I was wrong. I changed my mind. We can run. It doesn't happen. And they've seen that. And they start winning arguments with their friends. And Phil Armstrong, who just came on recently, a couple of years ago, he just loves it because he's now winning arguments with all these mainstream economists who are far more learned than he is, far more mm-hmm. you know astute. And he interviews them and gets them all tripped up, you know, without even trying, just with simple questions. And, and, that, and everybody experiences that idea that you know you know something important and you can understand it. And you want to explain it to everybody else. And look at real progressives. I mean, that's just like all non-technical people who are just. Uh, couldn't be more um, enthusiastic and more motivated 
you know, it's not possible but, going out and promoting this thing everywhere. Have you any internet, thoughts why else. that's not happening? Any thoughts on why that's not happening to the same degree in, in, in the UK? Well, maybe it is, but maybe it just started 10 years later. So we're, when you do that 248, 1632, it's up to a million in the US. You're still at the 1632, 64. It's just going to take a couple more years before it's up to you know, the million plus. So it's probably growing word of mouth. Look at yourselves, you know, uh, geometrically, and it just kind of ramps up with a geometric progression. And you're just a couple of years away, maybe, from that more of a general understanding like the US has. And if we ever would get any real leadership uh, like Yarmouth, uh, Congressman Yarmouth, out there in, in front and with credibility, then then everything, all the uh, dominoes would fall, I think, the remaining mm -hmm. dominoes would fall. Right now, we've got the chief economist at uh, Harvard University, uh, Jason Furman, still talking about like, well, MMTs, there's nothing new, it's old stuff. It's, you know, there is just fall risk. All of a sudden, you know, it's like, you know, the dinosaurs that you know, haven't quite gone extinct yet, but they're, they will. Uh, and they can't win an argument with anybody who, they could, certainly couldn't win any, those arguments with anybody at the Fed and Fed research or Treasury research people. They, they can win them with other academics who are just arguing mm -hmm. hypotheticals, but, you know. Well, the, the Bank of England are, are releasing a yeah. book um, later this yeah. year, and I think we've got quite good expectations that that's going to paint that that's going to paint the clear functioning of a central bank. Um, oh, good, to people. Good. It'll give us a lot of power to be able to say it's not it's not Kieran and I or Warren Moser or whoever saying this. It's the Bank of England yeah. talking about where money comes yeah, from. Yeah. If they don't know how tally sticks worked, who does, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> they, they have to know this stuff. Wrestling power away from the powerful is always difficult, isn't it? Yeah. You know, and that's what, what, where, 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 where were you? Where were you two on this five years ago? Nowhere, an, right? And so, <laughs> some, somehow, it, somehow, it didn't take thirty years from five years ago. It only took five years. Yeah, and I think the big difference is Karen and I aren't sitting on a huge amount of wealth from bonds. And that's where you know. <laughs> so, yeah, but you, 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 we would be doing that if we if we were. And you know, I, yeah, I think that's but, you know, I think that's my point, really. It's right. But it's my point is, you were, you, you were you were sitting on that not same. You weren't sitting on a pile five years ago either. But you just didn't have the opportunity to get introduced and to mm -hmm. recognize this is something worth spending your time on. But you have, and and the rate that people are getting introduced to it is accelerating. We had COVID scare and a week later global emissions drop 50 percent right well documented all of a sudden you can see china from space you could never see that before right and we did it by giving up non-essentials there was no starvation people weren't out in the cold people had clothing yeah some production of some of the stuff stopped but nothing you know nothing life-threatening right or, you know maybe a little bit around the edges but basically it was non-essentials and then we decided it's more important to bring back these non-essentials, bring emissions back up to where they were before and even higher, than to bring back the economy in some different method. There wasn't even a discussion. Okay, if there had been a discussion and that's the, the side that wanted to bring it back without emissions lost, okay, but there wasn't even a discussion. It was So that has to be near universal agreement to not even have a discussion that we're just going to bring this back. And now maybe over the next 30 years, we can drop things 10 or 15% and prevent. It's not going to, there isn't the political will. There isn't the will at the individual level to do any of this. Otherwise that wouldn't have happened to me. That was a real, uh, you know, wake up call as to this, where are human beings right now on this whole issue? When you see somebody saying, well, you know, I, I did a tweet showing that India was building uh, coal fired power plants. And the responses are, well, why shouldn't they? You know, they burn a lot less per capita than everybody else. And shouldn't they have electricity like the rest of us? And, okay. You know, <laughs> what, you know, that's an interesting response, right? But that tells me a lot more than somebody who says, yeah, they shouldn't do it. And, for, and at the same time, we should have to dismantle ours. Okay. At least that person's thinking in the right direction. But the other one who thinks all these emerging markets should be allowed to blow out more CO2 so they can catch up to us. It's like, what? where's this coming from? You know, it's not, this is not yeah. that kind of, that is not this kind of like imperative, you know, it's, it's a, uh, 
in people's, you know, it's, it's not important to them enough to do anything. It's just yeah. not, it's not important enough to turn the lights off when you leave the room. It just yeah. isn't. It's, I guess, it's not important to ban advertising on the internet, which would save huge amounts of CO2 emissions. Yeah. They just won't do it. Yeah. Okay. And so I think at this point, the individual, it's prudent to prepare for something, you know, for the worst, you know, hope for the best, but prepare for the worst, whatever that means. And, you know, I'm doing my best like explaining this to try and shock somebody into action, but I'm not all that hopeful that it's going to work. So yeah. monetary sovereignty in Scotland, um, you know, what do you think? Should we have it? Scotland should have its own taxing authority and its own tax credit, its own currency, which I've labeled the kilt, right? You're familiar yeah. with that? Okay. Yeah. So um, we won't go into that. So uh, without it, you don't have the ability to sustain full employment. Okay. And the, your real wealth of any province is your real output your real domestic output plus imports minus exports. It's the starting point. And from there, you can modify it for national interest and strategic interest. But your real wealth, as point of fact, is, you know, like the way I say it is economics is the opposite of religion. It's better to receive than to give, right? So um, it's your pile of stuff. And your pile of stuff is everything you can produce domestically plus your imports minus your exports. And so most of it is going to come from your domestic production, goods and services. So by keeping everybody fully employed, you optimize that and you're optimizing your real wealth. And you can't do that if you're on a fixed exchange rate or if you've got a, uh, using a foreign currency like the British pound, uh, you know, unless you have some arrangement for unlimited deficit spending from the UK, which is not even worth discussing. So for all practical purposes, you've got to have your own currency to do that. There's, there's no way around that. And, and so you have to decide if that's an important uh, goal, important to, to your life, you know, what, if, you, if that's the way you want to live your life, or do you want to live your life where you're going to have periodic, you know, um, thoughts of high unemployment and all the issues mm -hmm. that come with it and, uh, you know, elements of austerity. So you can't avoid those without having your own currency because yeah. you're you're going to be subject to those as long as you're using an external currency. And so then the question is, okay, how do you operate policy? And, and that's fine, but you've got to get to that point. And the way you get to that point is by pointing out, and I've got a paper on that. It's called exchange rate policy and full employment. That paper explains clearly why you need floating exchange rate policy, your own currency to be able to support full employment. And to me, that should be your number one uh, objective when you have um, the decision when you're making the currency decision for Scotland, do you want to support full employment, which is the essence of optimizing your real wealth, your true wealth? And, and that's pretty simple. So if you can get, if you can use that to say, okay, this is what we need. Now, what's our policy going to be? It's much easier. Right now, the debate kind of floats back and forth between using pounds, and fixed exchange rates, and this and that, without ever, without the primary focus being on, look, can we support unemployment or not? It's what is the trade balance going to do and how are we going to be able to import and all that? Don't start with that. Start with, look, we want to have full employment all, at all times because mm -hmm. that optimizes our real wealth. Not, don't use a bleeding heart argument because people have a right to full employment, which they do. I'm not arguing that. But the reason you want to do it collectively as a government is also and to some people, more important, <laughs> to 40% to of your population, more important. it's more important that you have um, optimal output. So if you can win that argument, this is how we optimize real economic performance is with floating exchange rate. Then you're also going to win the bleeding heart. And by the way, we're just going to have to accept full employment. Now all the, the you've just, you've, yeah. you've got everybody. Okay, but, so you don't want to exclude people. You don't have to, you want to get mm -hmm. this done. That, that optimum output is so important for a small country, isn't it? Yes, yes. It's more, more, more important for a small country because if you're larger, you can you can operate you can operate at a lower than than maximum because you're still creating so much. But for a country like yeah. Scotland, being yeah. size five and a half million people, it is so crucial that every resource is yeah. pulled in to the economy for it to work. Yeah. If you were in the position where 
um, the, the Scottish Government have just set up something called... So um, Scotland, as part of the United Kingdom, has yeah. a very different outlook than it would have as an independent country. Right, right, right. Could you, yeah, could, could you paint that picture yeah. of how different an economy like Scotland would be as part and of the United Kingdom not being able to issue its own currency and a yeah. country that is able to issue its own yeah. currency? So by having your own currency, you have the ability to educate your children such that they can be successful wherever they may want to go. And at the same time, have an economy that's vibrant enough, attractive enough, full employment economy where they, if they want to stay home, they can stay home and that you would be attractive to, you know, people, you know, globally, people would want to move to Scotland because of your economy. So you can only do that with, you know, independent Scotland with your own currency. You cannot do that as a province of the UK. It's wonderful that you said that because on top of the conversation we had with David McWilliams yesterday, he was talking much more about what independence allows a country to do in terms of discovering its creativity. And and, and what you've spoken about there is those kind of policy, those two policy approaches yeah. underpinned by currency, but it allows you to become the country that you really want to be in. And would you agree right, that it kind right. of unleashes that creativity and, and allows you to stand up in, in the world? Yeah, no, absolutely. And that's what I mean by a vibrant economy. Mm. Yeah, and maybe vibrant isn't, Maybe there's a better word, but you, you want to have an economy that's vibrant. That doesn't mean it's the fastest growing necessarily, but it's the most attractive to people. It's a place where people want to live. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. the important thing. That's the judge. Who judges it? Yeah. You know, is there a waiting list to get in? Do you see any Syrian refugees trying to get into China? <laughs> Yeah. Maybe it's yeah. not, maybe it's not so good. <laughs> yeah. That is a really important that is a really interesting point you've said about it not being the fastest growing economy because we still think that's the way to attract people is that you've yeah. got the fastest growing economy and not that there's full employment. Uh, it's a green economy, it's a circular economy, it's a healthy place to live. There's no there's pollution. Yeah, There's these are all the things that, sure. that do attract people, not not the well come here well, and you can you can oh, look, we have people money. here in St. Croix from Denmark. They were born in Denmark. And Denmark has everything that they don't have here. It's got you know the free medical and high quality education and nothing. They don't want to live there. Well, why not? It's boring. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it's sterile. That's what they say. I don't know if it is or not. <laughs> it doesn't have to be that way. That's what I mean by you want an economy where, you know, a country where people like yourselves want to move there, mm. you know. And so uh, that's not necessarily just a place where everything's in order and organized and, you know, every all the lawns are cut properly and there's strict, <laughs> strict laws and everything. You know, these are, you're talking about human beings who want to be able to display a level of creativity and see others' mm. creativity and have, you know, a vibrant economy, a dynamic. Maybe it should be a dynamic is the right mm. word, dynamic enough. I think, you know, look, if you start at unemployment and real wages and measure success of the economy that way, I, th I think that's a good start. If unemployment's low and real wages are high and growing nicely and you're satisfied that they're getting a fair share of the output, then you've got a successful economy. You know, set your own goals based on that. You don't need any, uh, any fancy econometric measurement techniques. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Okay. Thanks, Take Warren. Care. Bye now. Yeah. And there you go. Um, hope everyone in, enjoyed that. Let me know, do you think that was a good introduction to MMT or did we maybe go in a little bit too kind of high level? Should we have been a little bit more basic? That, that'd be really helpful. But thanks so much for the engagement. Um, Karen, what did you think looking back and watching that again? Yeah, so he, there was a couple of interesting points that he made as well that I didn't pick up on, you know, when we interviewed him. Um, interesting that the story about Barack Obama going to the Chinese and not, <laughs> not understanding the role of, of as of as the as the currency issuer, um, so that's that's a really interesting thing. So I think a lot of politicians need to take heart from that. Actually, when you know, President of the United States doesn't really understand it. how it works either. <laughs> yeah, and and it does just show you how complicated and how entrenched that narrative is 
that there's a debt and that someone someone owns it and a country can't do anything about that it is a really interesting uh, one for you to pick up on and uh, we've had a few comments actually we've had lots of comments and um, quite a few around another issue um, but quite a few around mmt and what we're covering tonight and um, we had a question that someone said they'd love to have asked warren and i said karen could probably have a stab at it and um, so and um, the, the question was could scotland launch its own currency at the moment if it wanted to so the, the Scottish government wouldn't be able to do that. I think the British government would probably stop them. Um, but the, um, the anyone can create a currency. Um, you know, transition towns, uh, we're talking about doing it. But the, the, the trick is to get it accepted. And uh, government money has the highest degree of moneyness um, because it's the taxation authority. So, you know, as Warren says, you know, your, your currency is fundamentally you, you, your tax credits. That's mm. what it is. That's what it is. That's why you need it, you know, because you will be taxed in that currency. Your VAT, all uh, that's all going to be paid in the, the country's currency. And, and that's where currency really started. And, um, you know, if, if it, it's... It's, you have, you've persuaded to use it because at some point someone's going to come around and demand that you pay taxes in that amount. And you can't do that with any currency in, unless you're the issuer. But yeah, I think there's um, historical precedent. And I think Iceland had a currency before it effectively moved off its own, it, it moved from... I can't remember who, um, yeah. the name of the, the name of the currency it was using. And But th there are complementary currencies and, and certainly you could... You, you, Scotland could look at that if they wanted, but the really important point is that for your own currency to work, you've got to be the issuer of that currency and you've got to be able to tax in that currency. Well, what I would say is with the Icelandic economy, we are talking about about 100 years ago um, because Olaf Ermar Gearson told us about that as well. So obviously our economy is much more complex now. So you're unlikely to get you know the large supermarkets to accept your, your currency uh, unless it's it's government currency, you know, and and I mean that's where most of my money goes. <laughs> so so I, on that note. Uh, so another a good question from Craig here. We're technically already using our own currency. We've been printing our own money since 1700s, um, and that that that's interesting. And it's covered. I, I can't remember who actually answers that, but it's a really good point, Craig, because I I do think a lot of people and. Um, are, are a little bit confused by that because we're just issuing we're just being allowed to issue a note but it's someone else's currency we're told how to much you know if, if you want to look at it in more simple simple terms so um it's not our currency we've just been given the right to to print that money um, as Northern Ireland does and, and as we do in Scotland. So I think it's a, that's a, a common um, misunderstanding, I, th I think, Craig, but it's very, very different. And what we're trying to do on the show is drag people away from thinking about the note in their wallet to much more about who creates that currency and what you can do with it kind of society-wide rather, rather than, you know, what you can do with that note and, and what it looks like in your pocket. Um, thanks, Charles. Um, he said this is an excellent intro to MMT. That's good to hear. Um, I asked the I asked the audience, and two people have said they got a bit distracted um, from my question, so I'm sorry about that. And, and it was this one here. Um, I said, where do you think this would most likely to have traction? Um, we've got one person who I think is pretty clear on MMT, and that's Agnes. Uh, uh, Agnes. Agnes. No, not Agnes. Angus McNeil, <laughs> Angus McNeil um, in uh, Westminster. And we're going to invite him onto the show to have a chat about MMT. And I've also asked him if there's anyone else on his side of the benches or the opposite side of the benches who he thinks understands MMT. So it'd be quite interesting. And I think that's a fundamental question for us to ask as we look towards an independent Scotland. Do we think that there is a level of understanding within Holyrood to see that a, a very different approach to um, monetary policy is possible. So it'd be quite interesting. I'm glad if a couple of people thought about that because I do think it's important. Uh, would you agree, Kieran? It's something we really need to think about. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm distracted by the, the Hashbury yeah, I've done it again. Statement <laughs> below, um, because, because he's saying, um, uh, you know, should Westminster or, or, or Holyrood follow, follow MMT? So um, modern monetary theory is a bit like, um, you could say it's like evolutionary theory. It just is. You know, the dinosaur bones just 
got found, you know, and 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 so it's uh, you know evolution is not a policy; it just exists. And mm. uh, that the, you know the the facts that that governments create their own currencies and they're no longer backed by gold just exists. So it's that's what modern monetary theory is saying is you know we're not in a situation where uh, uh, most countries are not in a situation where they're having to adhere to the gold standard because that ceased in 1971. So countries are not constrained by their currency. They're constrained by their real resources and they're constrained by, um, uh, they can't spend as much as the private sector or, you know, it depends if the, the public sector and private sector are competing for resources that will create inflation. So those are your constraints. But you're not constrained with your currency, but you're constrained what you can do with your currency. So you know you could you might you might want to have more train lines going around Scotland. But if you don't have enough people to man those train lines or want to work on those train lines, you can't make that happen with the currency. The currency is a tool that can mobilize the real resources, but if the real resources are not there, you can't make it happen. Absolutely. Um, and Mark, thanks for your comments, which I broke up on, I brought up on screen because, yeah, we agree completely. I think you're in summarising uh, some of the things we're seeing uh, really well. Um, here's a comment again from someone uh, under the um, the name The Brink. And and, and again, see that, that, you know, there is this Scotland does have some tax power, so can it have its own uh, its own currency? You know, so there, there, there's some really interesting questions, I think, coming from the discussion. So that's great. Yeah, I think it's it's just it would just be too complex just now, and I, I think the British government would probably, you know, give us make it difficult. Um, you know, we just need to vote for independence and <laughs> and 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 set up our own central bank and be an independent country and go our own way and do our own things and uh, yeah, pay our own pensions and our own currency, all of that. You know, pay our own benefits, pay our civil servants our own currency. And when that is the tax credit, that's that's how it works. It's the tax. Yeah, and I and I think um, well, I can certainly see, and I hope people who are watching and listening can also see that um, when you have that position as an issuer, some of the conversations that we've been having over the past couple of weeks around pensions and benefits. Um, it's much easier to solve because, of course, if you've got to go to Westminster and say, please, can you pay your pensions? is a very different situation than saying, well, of course we can pay our pensions because we pay our pensions and the tax credit. And, you know, we have to pay you that and, and get it back. And that's what oils the, um, the, the, the economy. So I, I really do think this is a fundamental thing for anyone who's interested in economics or politics and certainly for independent supporters to kind of understand. And as um, Mark was saying, it's a MMT is a description of the economy. It's really down to the politicians to decide if that's what they, if they want to use the understanding to to prescribe uh, a different way for the economy to work. Well, thanks very much for your comments. Uh, Kieran. anything else? Yeah, I would just say that in response to that, that I, I think that quite a number of politicians in the Westminster government understand exactly how it works, but they, they're using their understanding of exactly how the currency works to um, give their friends bungs. <laughs> and that's not, and that the, 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 the issue is, um, you have to vote in the right people. So again, I go back to strengthening your democracy. And I, I would say, you know, I, I've just been to a hustings. You know, if you're not involved in a political party, you can't go to a hustings and you can't vet the, the prospective candidates. So, you know, if you want to be involved in vetting the prospective candidates that go forward and it's coming up for the council election soon, then you have to get involved more deeply. Um, so that you know, that's up to you how involved in the in the democracy you want to be in. But you know, I would say get more involved in the democracy in some sort of way. You know, yeah. that's that's the important thing. I think the other thing that Warren brought up as well was the the non correlation between interest rates and inflation, and that hasn't been for a long time. And that's you know, and the central bankers seem to be thinking that they're having their moment right now, but also. The, the central bankers, the academics at the central banks, tend to think differently from the political appointees to the central banks. Yeah, well, well you have a look at um, Michael's point, Kieran. Um, uh, the, it, what what we have what we have found with this injection of um, currency into the economy is that it's been used 
and there's been an outcome from that. And if we look at quantitative easing, the outcome has been to inflate asset prices and has to been to increase inequality. Now, there's an understanding that governments can print money and they can do something with it. And I think we have to move towards the idea that this money could be used much more efficiently, either spent by government into the economy to build infrastructure or given to people who need it rather than as a way to inflate um, assets of the already wealthy. So, uh, if, Michael, if that's a little bit along the lines of, of what you're talking about in terms of prescription, then, um, yeah, I think it's really important that we do think about that. Do you want to just tackle Michael's point there, Kieran? Yeah, I was just going to say that, you know, yeah, inflation, inflation is an indicator of lots of different things. So, for example, you know, nefarious price setting, which um, uh, Fidel Kaboob brought up, I think, in our first episode, you know, this is something that a government can control. But if you vote for a libertarian government that doesn't really want to govern, then, <laughs> then they're not going to try and control that because they, they believe that the market will solve everything. Um, I don't believe that. So, so, so you know, you have to you, you have to choose your politicians wisely. Again, I'm going to make that point really strongly. Mm. <laughs> and, and Michael, best of luck with that. It looks like you're diving in really deeply um, to MMT. Thanks very much for helping out with some of the questions and the comments. Really good. Um, and I'll I'll bring that up as well. We have been joined from. Um, Pittsburgh, which is one of my favourite cities in, in, in the US. I absolutely love it there. I love it there. It really reminded me of Glasgow, uh, a real kind of industrial heartland city. And I was there in January and it was just as cold as uh, Glasgow January. Well, Michael, thanks so much for joining us. Um, uh, we really appreciate that. Um, well, we've got some other um, comments. And um, thanks very much. You know, we're really keen to, to kind of to push this out and, and raise the awareness of it. Um, I'll just drink break this one up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and it'll be yeah. interesting to see where monetary sovereignty uh, fits fits into that. Well, everyone, thank you for your engagement this evening. Um, next week, as I said at the start, we've got a really interesting kind of personal story. It's a little bit different from from what we've had in the past, um, but it was really insightful and you know, and Patricia, a really interesting person. So, um, thanks very much for joining us uh, tonight. I hope you'll join us uh, next week. And um, also, I'm going to do this because Kieran told me off last time. I didn't mention our Patreon. <laughs> um, please do join us on Patreon if you can. Um, uh, um, you get some access early access and there's um, a show we're just about to upload actually which is uh, 18 minutes of uh, David McWilliams speaking about the difficulty of Scotland having its own currency uh, that'll be for patrons only and also it helps us create the wonderful documentaries which we're coming up this year so please do consider supporting us on Scotonomics if you can. Do you not remember telling me off Karen? No. <laughs> uh, okay um th thank thanks everyone and um karen i'll see you soon and hopefully i'll see everyone next week please do um drop comments so you've had we've had lots of comments on the right hand panel but if you could just before you disappear if you're on um, facebook or youtube just say great show um or, or whatever you want in the comments because that helps us get a little bit more coverage uh, thanks so much cheers Cheer. bye now bye <laughs> Thank you.